Well, good morning. Pastor Chris Myros here from Glory Baptist Church. And as happens from time to time, our sermon system doesn't work for the recording of the video. And so today I'm going to just re-record that video. The unfortunate part of that always is that it's not live. It doesn't have the inflection. You can't see me move my hands or move around and talk, but I'll do my very best to uh, at least convey the, the the message to you as best as I can in case you would like to watch this video. The sermon's about foot washing. It comes from John 13, 1 through 20. And there it reads, and you're going to see, I have a computer screen over here um, that's got my notes on it, so I'll be kind of looking a little off to the side. That's not because I'm not trying to look at you. It is because I'm trying to make sure I uh, get to you the information that I've put together for this sermon. Anyhow, John 13, 1 through 20 says, Now before the feast of Passover, let me try this again. I can't even read sometimes. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist. <clears throat> then he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterwards you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Verse 9, Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. <clears throat> If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you, if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, many of you will believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. Now, in this passage, Jesus is about to enter into a war. And I say that because John is especially in John's Gospel, anyhow, John is using, at times, a, a very military orientated language um, to describe what Jesus is about to do. Uh, the steadfastness with which he sets his face to heading towards Jerusalem. Um, now he's literally hours away from the betrayal, from a, a trial that is coming, um, his crucifixion and his death. And, and how do you prepare for something like that? How do you prepare yourself? And how do you prepare these men, these disciples? How do you prepare them for the eventuality of the things that Jesus know is, knows is to come? Um, when, we read in, when we read Shakespeare's words in Henry V, uh, in the Battle of Agincourt, um, he says these famous words. He says, when trying to be prepared for these battles, he says, imitate the actions of the tiger. Stiffen up the sinews, summon up the blood. And how does Jesus prepare his disciples for the things that are about to transpire in the next few hours in his life? Now, as we lead into Easter here, um, we are a, a few weeks out from Easter, I think um, six weeks, 
I think that's right. I think we're six weeks out from Easter, and as we head that direction in the sermon series, we're going to be seeing some of Jesus' final few hours of his earthly life. And, and in, in reading the book of John, um, where we get to today in chapter 13 is, is a transition point in the book of John. In chapters 1 through 12, uh, we talked about this in one of the early sermons, that those first 12 chapters are the books of signs or miracles, um, where we looked at seven different signs in the last few months uh, that John had singled out things that he'd portrayed that that spoke to the identity of Jesus as the Son of God. And then now as we get into chapter 13, um, it, it's a transition point and we've, we've moved into that, that upper room. And we've also changed in, as far as the book goes. We're now in the book of glory portion of John. And Jesus had veiled himself to the world, and, and, and now he is beginning to disclose a, a, a little something of his glory, something of that relationship that he has with his Father in heaven. Um, he begins to share a little bit of that with his disciples. Now, one commentary on John's Gospel says, um, If the other Gospels show us Christ's body, then John shows us his soul. I think that's from uh, John Calvin, actually. And what we have today in this story is is um, an action that's followed by a, a discourse by Jesus. And the scene is described for us in this opening five verses. Um, there's another description of it, of course, in, in verse 12. And, and, and it's this task that Jesus does, um, washing someone's feet. And if you don't know the culture and you don't know the background of this, this was a menial task. This was a task largely reserved if you had a slave or a servant, that was their job. Or if you were in a group of people and there was nobody um, employed to do this or enslaved to do this, whoever was lowest on the social strata, low man on the totem pole, that was the person whose job it was then, it's their responsibility, to wash people's feet. Now this would happen upon entry into a home. <clears throat> you'd, you'd be walking from wherever you came, of course, they didn't have cars in those days, and you'd enter into their home, and just as you'd enter into their home, you'd take off your shoes, as, as it's done commonly in, in our world as well. Um, if you come to my house, we... We take our shoes off when we come in, and you'll see in the entryway a large number of shoes that have collected there so that uh, as kids are coming in and out and as we go out and walk the dog and everything, it's there, and that allows us to concentrate uh, whatever we bring into the house right there. And then we have a rug we can take in and out, and we can power wash it, clean it, and take good care of it to keep the rest of the house clean. And so back at this time, they, they did something similar. <clears throat> you never knew what was on the streets. And I'm going to pause. Sorry about that. Had to clear my throat. But you never knew what was on the street. And so uh, what you had walked through on the way there was on your shoes, was on your feet. This is back before the time, before there was sewers and before uh, cars were invented. So you had all kinds of disgusting things out on the roads. And inevitably, some of that could get onto your shoe and feet if you weren't careful. And so not a a job that was a desired task, and you'd come into the house, you'd sit down or probably recline more on the floor. They didn't have chairs as we think of traditional chairs for the most part, and uh, would largely, largely sit on pads, blankets, kinds of things on the floor. And somebody's task then was to, to come over and uh, make sure you had got your feet washed when you arrived. And no one has done it. And so... Jesus rises, he takes off his outer garments, he wraps a towel around himself, he gets a bowl of water, and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. And from that, this event, this incident, becomes uh, a parable for Jesus. Now, it's a real thing that happened, but he also uh, kind of gives it a, a double purpose, a double meeting. It becomes a lesson of something far greater 
than just the washing of feet. It becomes a a, a symbol um, of, of what Jesus has come to this earth and to do. Um, it becomes symbolic of what it is, uh, the very heart of being a disciple, the very heart of being a servant. And, and, and my goal in this sermon is I want to enter into the mind of Jesus a little bit as he approaches these final hours of his life here on earth. I want to see three different things that, that John makes it apparent are on his mind with the crucifixion looming just right there in the distance. And it seems that the first thing that's on his mind that John shows to us is that Jesus knows quite readily that his death is near. As we read in verse 1, and John puts all of these things kind of right at the very beginning for us to see, but we see this in verse 1, it, it says that Jesus, knowing his hour, had come. Now up until this point in John's gospel, we'd read things like, his hour had not yet come. And, and then when you'd see that, then... Jesus would withdraw from the situation. He would uh, leave the public sphere. He would <clears throat> go on a he'd go retreat and, and go somewhere else. But now it seems the uh, uh, the the hour has arrived, and, and everything in this story of the Book of John has been moving towards this point because very very shortly Jesus is going to be betrayed. Very shortly he, he's about to be arrested. Very very shortly. Uh, He's going to be tried. He's he's going to be crucified. Uh, He he knows what is coming. He knows the the pain and the suffering that is just there on the horizon. Jesus is aware. And when we're facing pain or when we're experiencing pain, uh, the truth of the matter is that's when most of us are are prone to, to justify and concentrating on ourselves, right? You see this happen, and I think we all probably do it. It's that uh, I'm suffering, or or at least I'm about to suffer, and so this is the time for, for, for you to focus on me, right? To show, you can show me your love because I'm the one who's suffering. This is the time for you to, to, to show sympathy to me. You to me, not me to you. That's how we act, right? That's our natural response. And I want us to see the the heart of Jesus here. I I want to see his servant-like heart. That that on the very threshold of his own pain, he knows what's coming. He has the needs of the disciples on his mind. And he he, he has this, this, this simple, humbling gesture of the needs of his disciples to have their feet washed. These men were probably tired. They'd been traveling. And in the moment, Jesus stops, and he ministers to them, knowing, even in that moment, that his hour had come. It's a truly profound lesson. Sometimes we are called to serve others, even in the midst of our pain and suffering, even when we're blinded by our tears, even when there's something going on in our lives that might normally make us think otherwise, that, oh, no, we should focus on me. But sometimes we are called to love and serve others, even when we can't see a way forward, where it seems like there's darkness all around us, where we are being pressed upon by our own difficulties. And at that time, we're still called to love and serve others. But it's so tempting in those moments to say, can't, can't, can't you see what's going on in my life, right? Can't you see that I'm busy? Can't you see my pain? Can't, can't you see my needs? Can't you see my burdens? And it's tempting for us in those moments to just simply say, I don't have time for you right now. I'm dealing with this. I've got to concentrate on me. Right here. This is where I'm concentrating. And this can happen in all of our relationships. It could be with our spouses, with our children, with co-workers, people at school, our neighbors. And here, we see Jesus saying, My hour has come. 
I know what stands before me. I, I see it clearer than I ever have, probably. I know what lies before me. And then in the midst of that, he does this astonishing act. He's thinking about others. He's, he's thinking about his disciples and their needs, and he's putting their needs first. And he stops, and he takes off his outer garments, and he wraps a towel around himself. And he begins this menial task of washing his disciples' feet. The second thing it would appear in Jesus' mind on this day at this time is that it seems pretty clear that Jesus loved his disciples to the end. Despite all of their failings, despite the fact that these men were prone to bickering with one another, despite the fact that they were largely missing the point of many of the things he was teaching and telling them, despite the fact that, that, that one of them would betray him, despite the fact that one of them would, was going to deny him three times. Not once, not twice, but three times, right? And in spite of all of their self-centeredness, their selfishness, in spite of all of that, Jesus loves them to the very end. At the time of Jesus' crucifixion, there's going to be barely <clears throat> a disciple to be found. Just John, when Jesus is up on the cross. And he loves them anyhow. Fickle, frail, just fleeting as their faith is, he loves them. And it's not a pretty sight. There's, frankly, something profoundly disappointing about these men. And yet, he loves them to the very end. Jesus' love isn't blind, but he loves these men. He chose these men. He's, he's been with them for the better part of three years. He knows them better than they even know themselves. He knows all about them, in fact. He knows them at their worst. He knows what they are capable of doing. In fact, as I mentioned before, he, he gives a, a prediction about two of them here, uh, about what is about to come and about what they're about to do. He talks about Judas and Peter, of course. He's, he's seen these men at their, their, their very worst possible light. And he loves them anyhow. He knows what they are capable of. He, he's seen into their hearts. But he loves them. And not only does he love them, he's going to deny himself. He's going to lay his life down for them. He's going to die for them. It's like the song says, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would he devote the sacred head for such a worm as I? But there's also uh, a deeper meaning going on here as well. He loved them. We're told to the very, very end. Um, he loved them to the end of his earthly life. He, but he loved them to the extreme limit in that sense. He loved them knowing what it was going to cost him. He knew even now, in, in perhaps ways he had never seen more clearly before, the, the cost of that love, what it would mean. It was inescapable and on his consciousness, um, through his prayerful communion with God the Father, it had been revealed to him now, uh, he, he understand with great clarity exactly what was set forth before him, the path that he was on. There was no turning back. Jesus knew what was coming. And here he is in the upper room. He's, he's, he's fully aware of this cost of loving he knows what is coming, and he's prepared to go to the very limit. He's prepared to love them to the very end. It will cost Jesus unimaginable suffering and pain, and he's going to endure torments that no one should ever endure, torments of a condemned man, and he will become our sin. He will identify himself with sin. Can you imagine that? Actually... I don't, I don't think we can imagine that. What does it mean for, for pure holiness to identify itself with sin? 
It's a revulsion of sin. And Jesus on our behalf, he, he, he will be dealt with as sin deserves. Sin will be condemned in his body, cursed in his person. There will be no, no sparing of him. The, the fullness of, of the wrath of God is not mitigated. It's not held back. It's fully poured out on him, poured out on him in, in, in all of its perfect strength. And in those moments as he experienced that, in, in that darkness, there will be no light. And we see in the story that even the sun refuses to shine, that even the, the, the earth refuses to hold it, Jesus in the ground, and he's cast out into darkness where there is wailing and gnashing of teeth. The passage in one of the creeds says, and he descended into hell. And I know there's some people who have trouble with that phrase. But if you think about what hell is, hell is simply the, the absence of the presence of God. Yes, there's, there's other things, but the thing that is most painful and most apparent, the worst, the very worst part of hell, is the absence of the presence of God. And Jesus, who has perfectly been in relationship with God the Father for all of eternity, is willing to take that on himself. That separation, the suffering and pain that comes with that, we know because Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he becomes the, the one upon whom God cannot look, the one who God can't cast his eye upon. And, and, and there's a, a veil that's drawn over his consciousness so that in his sonship there can be a, a division and a split, even though just temporary. And notice how Jesus doesn't say, My Father, my Father, why have you forsaken me? He says, My God, my God. That intimacy is broken. He's gone to a place where law and reason and meaning make no sense. And he cries out, Why? And he hears no answer. The angels don't come down and rescue him. God's voice doesn't speak to him. He's in darkness. And he experiences every drop of God's wrath. No holding back. And he does so on our behalf. And he's willing to bear that. And so as he reclined in the upper room that day, he was there to partake in this Passover meal with his disciples, with all of this looming before him in the hours and days to come, he does something that really seems out of the ordinary. You see, if I knew what was coming, if, if I knew my friends were going to betray me, if I knew that I was about to be arrested, if I knew I was about to be crucified, I think my natural response is to turn and run the other way as fast as I can. Right? That's what most of us would do. If we knew that level of pain and suffering was on our horizon, we're not hanging out for that. And what does Jesus do? He takes off his outer garment, wraps a, a towel around himself, and begins to wash the disciples' feet. 
John then brings us a, a third thing that Jesus was conscious of. And it's this. He did all of this for his people, even though he was fully conscious of his deity. You see, Jesus knows his divine origin. He knows his purpose. And knowing that his hour had come, that he was about to depart from this world and and go back and be with the Father eventually. And in verse 3 it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. And and that's that's a wonderful statement about the deity of Christ, that he's conscious, that he has come from God, that he's going back to God, that he's sat at the very same table as the Father in heaven and he's going back there. And in the full consciousness of who he was, And in the full consciousness of of his native glory and his essential deity, Jesus knows who he is. And yet, he takes off his outer garment, gets down on the floor, and begins to wash feet in full consciousness of who he was. And what does that say to us? Well, it says to us that the impulse to serve lies at the very heart of God. God the Father serving the Son, the Son serving the Father. It's traced right back to the Trinity itself. And in the moment, Peter's amazed by this. And Peter says, you, Jesus, you're going to wash my feet? Never. 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 And Jesus reminds him, he says, What I do now you may not understand, but afterwards you will understand. And how true was that? Because it's, it's John who, who helped makes this apparent to us. But what was Jesus demonstrating in the full consciousness of his deity? Well, I think it was several things. And first of all, as I said earlier, Jesus turns this into a parable. When Peter says, Never, Lord. You're, not, you're never going to wash my feet. He says that in verse 8. And then Jesus says, Well, unless I, I wash you, you'll have no part of me. Unless you are willing to bow down before me and allow me to wash away your sin, you'll have no part with me. You'll have no fellowship with me. You'll have no union with me. That's what Jesus is really saying. But Jesus turns it into something a little bit more because Peter, and, and, and he just, I, I love Peter. You've got to love Peter. Peter's, uh, I identify with him so well um, because, you know, it's open mouth, insert foot, time and time again. He's, he's the guy who's, you know, just jumps out of the frying pan right into the fire kind of guy. And, and he utters these words, you know, this, this, this never Lord idea. But then he says, not my, not just my, feet, Lord, but that wash my hands, wash my head, wash all of me, of course. And so Jesus turns it into a parable, and he says, no, Peter, you are clean. And of course, he's referring to the the custom that before you went and ate the Passover meal, you would have bathed, you would have been preparing yourself and gotten yourself ceremonially clean so you could visit the temple, and so you would have washed, and, and when you would have arrived for this meal, you would have mostly been clean, and the only thing that would have needed cleansing would be to wash your feet because of the dust you'd accumulated on the road, on your bare feet and the sandals. And so Jesus says, you are clean. And all that's necessary, Peter, is that I wash your feet. And this could be Jesus alluding to the difference between justification and sanctification. They're already clean, but Not all of them, as Jesus says. He knows Judas is in their company still. We'll get more to, we'll get more about Judas, talk more about that some other time. But Peter and the eleven, they were clean, and, and all that they needed was to have their feet washed. The thing preeminently that Jesus wants them to understand, as he tells us in verse 15, is this. He says, For I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done to you. At the the very heart of discipleship, at the heart of what it means to be a Christian, is a willingness to humble ourselves, even as Jesus humbled himself. 
That is what Jesus is exhibiting to us. It's the very same idea that Peter later restates in his uh, first epistle in, in, in 1 Peter 5, 5. Peter himself says, clothe yourself with humility. And as I hear these words and as I read the story, it makes me wonder today, in the, in the face of the cross, in the face of the enormity of Christ's love for each and every one of us, how far are we willing to go? Or, or maybe restated as, what is it we are unwilling to do? What are the things that we think are below us? What are the things that we're afraid of and make us uncomfortable? What are the things that we're not willing to do for our brother or our sister to show them love as Christ showed love? And here Jesus tells us, he says, get off your high horse, swallow your pride, put down your proud peacock feathers, do as I did. If I'm willing to go to the very end and love you because I know you, and I know your messes, but I love you anyhow. And if I'm willing to love you to the very end, if I'm willing to take this upon myself, if I'm willing to do all of this for you, what then is it that you're unwilling to do for others. And that is such a profound and humbling lesson for us. And it exposes in it, in the midst of that, it it shows us some of our sin. When we examine the things that we're unwilling to do for someone else in love, to share Christ's love with them, it shows our heart. Our heart is revealed in that. And so, what are you willing to do or, or unwilling to reach someone for Christ? To love as Christ loved? If we will humble ourselves as Christ humbled himself, I believe God can do some truly amazing things. And I would challenge you, give it a shot. Be willing to be a little uncomfortable. Step outside of your comfort zone. Expand your comfort zone. Go forth and love and humility. Maybe it means doing a a simple, humbling task to show somebody love. But as we approach Easter, I'm praying that God gives each and every one of us an opportunity to do this, that that we might love and that we might serve in, in radical ways, and that it might open up doors for us to continue to invest and then invite so that people might have the opportunity to join us maybe for Easter worship and come and celebrate the risen Christ. Easter is just a few weeks away, and each and every one of us needs to begin thinking, who can I talk to? Who can I invite? Who can I invest in so that they might be willing to come and worship and hear about the risen Christ? What is it we're willing or unwilling to do to see that others see the love of Christ? Remember the amazing things he did for you. Let us pass that blessing on to others. Let's make much of Christ in all things. Amen. Well, thanks for watching today. Have a blessed day.